You're watching CTS, family friendly television. Welcome to our show on the line. I'm Christine Williams. Do you or someone you know feel he or she is being spied on at work? That feeling could be accurate. Stay tuned as we discuss privacy in the workplace. came out in the Globe and Mail earlier this month that cited the case of a traveling sales rep whose employer hired a detective agency to follow her. It was found she was picking up her husband and driving him to work when she should have been visiting clients. She was fired for stealing company time and money. She didn't dispute it but found it unnerving being spied on. How do you feel on the matter? Do you think it's a violation to be watched and followed by your employer or perhaps have your computer or phone monitored or do you think the employer has that right? Let me know how you feel at any time in our show today. My first guest is Brian King. He is the president of Canada's largest private investigations company, King Reed and Associates. Brian, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. You're welcome, Christine. Brian, this industry, this private investigations industry, particularly in the area as it, as it relates to monitoring what goes on in, in corporations, is on the rise, is it not? It's a, it's, a, it's a substantial growth industry, yes. How much of a growth are you experiencing well, at this point? Our firm alone, I think we've, we've experienced about a 25% growth over the last uh, three or four years, and uh, it doesn't seem to be letting up at all. And why is that? Um, I think there's a there's a number of reasons. I think that um, um, uh, employers are becoming a little bit more um, uh, aggressive in certain areas um, as far as their business is concerned. I think there's been a lot of um, um, mitigating factors in the world. You know, with with um, the uh, uh, certainly the bombing of the uh, World Trade Centers, um, um, the the downturn in the stock market, um, 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 the situation with Enron in the U.S. where where we um, we found that uh, probably a little bit more due diligence could have done with the hiring of some of the senior executives there. Uh, just a number of reasons. Are these are these these reasons are broad reasons? Yes. But do you find when people consult you, it's usually because. As, a, as an individual company, they have had experiences in the past that they just don't want repeated. Exactly. I mean, uh, traditionally, an investigation firm like like mine is hired uh, by employers to to um, react to a problem they've had. Uh, the, there's a situation arose that that may lead them to to hiring us. And I think what happens is is they, is they become aware that maybe they should be a little bit more proactive with with uh, things like their hiring and and uh, and other areas and and uh, uh, putting together uh, a better plans of how they, they deal with these situations. So they, they tend to look at us to, to help them in a proactive manner as well. Interestingly, you mentioned the hiring issue. Are companies engaging in hiring private investigators when they they're thinking of hiring somebody in the process? Well, well, they do. They they um, um, they hire investigation firms or pre-screening companies to to do um, um, normal background checks, reference checks. Um, I think uh, they tend to to now look at somebody that can do a little more thorough job than what's traditionally done, um, in light of some of the situations that have arose, risen in the in the financial sectors and some other areas. Yes. Overall, is information being uncovered, perhaps that potential employees have criminal records that they perhaps <laughs> forgot to include <laughs> when asked. Is, is, this, is this whole business of hiring a private investigator, is it really turning up a lot of information well, than it, thought possible? It, 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 it tends to. I think some people are a little naive to the fact that, um, that certain things won't be uncovered. You understand that all of these things that we're talking about are done with the employee's authorization. So these are not done, you know, surreptitiously. I mean, the employee signs waivers to allow a criminal record checked on or a financial background and, right. and these types of things. But I, I think sometimes they're, maybe they're very hopeful that, that, that some of the things aren't uncovered. And, and what I suggest to most people is, is disclose it at the time. That's and right. if they do, then you know it, it doesn't look like they've been hiding something. Well, let's take a peek into the workplace, if you pardon the <laughs> pun. <laughs> <laughs> when, when a worker is, well, in his or her workplace, 
are they usually made aware of the policies of the organization that they work for? Well, I, I in terms of I, the I privacy, if, I don't know if they always are, but they should be. I mean, it's certainly uh, our recommendations to any of our clients that that um, um, they have certain policies and procedures which do outline what they will do with respect to investigations and investigations in the workplace. And I think that this should be something that is a part of any employer's policies and procedures manual, so that the employees are aware. You know, a good example might be if if and, and not all employers do this, but in the certain work environments where where um, um, video surveillance may be required. And I think that, that in that, those cases, the employees should be aware um, 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 that they are being videotaped when it's, a, when, it's a, when it's an overt situation. There is time and again where where um, what we call covert surveillance may be required to isolate a certain problem. Um, a good example might be theft or, or, or substance abuse in the workplace and that type of thing. Um, but um, as a general rule, I think that the employees should be aware when, you know, um, when uh, it's an environment where continual uh, visual surveillance is taking place that they are. And I think most do. Yeah. Well, you mentioned about substance, abu substance abuse and the possibility of somebody, well, theft in the workplace. And I'm sure there's a whole host of other reasons. Yes. Can you provide some of those reasons why you get calls? Well, well, you know, a good example, as, as you just mentioned, the substance abuse might be a case where, where you have employees that are working in an environment where um, um, they're using heavy equipment or, or equipment that may be dangerous to others. And if you have someone that, um, that um, um, is either doing drugs or, or drugs, drinking alcohol at lunch hours um, uh, and coming back to a work in a state that makes them a little disoriented and using this equipment other people get injured and you understand that that the use of firms like mine has evolved because of problems like this that have occurred and uh, and so I think that they're just being the employers are being a little extra cautious and also protecting their own liability if they're aware of these things going on and not doing anything about it they could be held liable. Well, before we continue let's go to Joy on line five. Hi Joy. Hello. Hi, you're on the air. Oh, yes. Um, I have a comment. I'm basically experiencing some of the very same things in terms of privacy in the workplace. The problem I have is that I took a leave of absence that was approved, and when on my return to work, my employer insists on in me giving them access to my family doctor's medical records of, of about, about me. And the problem with that is that it has been in the workplace where I work that there's been a problem with confidentiality where um, the staff medical problems and their medical history have been emailed and what have you throughout the workplace. And so because I did not want to do that, I found myself barred from actually having access to my workplace. And I would like to know what is an employer entitled to in terms of your own personal medical file in order to be employed within a workplace if you already be deemed to be not contagious, you know, the danger to you, yourself or your co-workers, how much information are they supposed to have in terms of your personal medical records? Thank you very much, Joy. Brian, can you answer that question? Joy, um, um, firstly, I think, uh, I think uh, following me today, there may be some, some lawyers speaking on employment yes. law that, yes. that you might better address that question to. But uh, from what you've told me, if you've taken a leave of absence, that if the leave of absence is unrelated to your medical condition, I would, um, um, I would think, or it wasn't approved, um, leave of absence with no conditions. I, I, personally, I, I would not think that the employer should have a, a, a reason to see your medical documentation. If, if the medical documentation is relative to the reason for the leave of absence and you extended the leave of absence, they may have a right to see it. But I, I certainly think from based on what you've told me, Joy, that you, you do have um, um, some reasons to be concerned, especially if your medical documentation is being emailed to people that, that you have not given the authority to see it. Um, uh, I would certainly think that you're probably best to consult an employment lawyer to, to discuss this because it certainly sounds to me, based on what you said, that you're being treated unfairly. And that's, that brings me, before we go for a break, to my next question, Brian. Private investigators, do they not operate under a restriction when they're given an assignment? Well, first of all, let me say restriction. We are licensed. We're licensed through the Ministry of Solicitor General's office. So we do have rules and guidelines that we have to follow. And um, even when we're given an assignment, let's say um, we're retained by a corporation to, to conduct certain investigations, no matter what they ask us to do, we still have to follow 
um, proper laws, rules, regulations. And, and, and our licensing is tightly controlled. I mean, if we step over the lines, you lose your license, you lose your livelihood. So um, generally speaking, um, um, I think that most licensed private investigators have a very strong um, uh, rules and regulations that they have to follow. So, so um, yeah, we are, we are regulated to, to, um, uh, to, uh, to a degree. Well, Brian, there's certainly a lot more I'd like to talk to you about. Brian will be back after this break, but you'll meet our second guest. Stay tuned. Welcome back. How do you feel about privacy in the workplace? Whose side are you on? Call us and let us know. With me in the studio now is our second guest, Michael Mulroy. Michael is a lawyer whose practice deals exclusively with employment and labor law. Michael, thank you for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. Now let's look at this whole issue of rights, particularly on the employee side. What does the government offer in terms of employee rights? Well, the government at this point, um, if you're referring to the actual legislation, privacy legislation, yes. is only at the federal level at this point. And that is um, uh, legislation that was introduced to help control the use of personal information. And it does set a standard for collecting information, uh, keeping information, and releasing information. Uh, however, that is going to eventually apply to the provincial level. And um, if the provinces have not enacted privacy legislation by January 1st, 2004, then the federal legislation will apply. So uh, Ontario, for example, is dealing with developing its own Privacy Act at this time. In 2004, is a new legislation not supposed to come in? To the pro and something new to be added to the privacy, privacy legislation. That's right. The provincial yes. level, it's expected Ontario will have a Privacy Act which will uh, govern um, most of the businesses that operate in Ontario then. What's included specifically in this Act? In, in the Act, it's contemplated that any personal information that is uh, um, collected regarding the employee has to be maintained um, and a disclosure has to involve consent and um, it also establishes um, guidelines for establishing when there's a legitimate reason for the collection of the information. So we're starting to see some control over uh, in creating ex express legislation that says, under these circumstances, you have a right to collect information. Michael, we had an earlier caller, Joy, who was talking about a particular situation she was in to give out this kind of a health information. You were sitting in the green room at the time. Yes, I heard And the you question. heard this. Yeah. Yes. Can you answer her more yeah. explicitly well, on um, this? She does have concerns that are completely legitimate. She should uh, feel that her medical information that is disclosed is protected within the workplace. So most employers would um, keep that information confidential and if she is working in a, in a workplace that does not have those systems in place, then she has a right to be concerned about it. She should only be, uh, reveal information um, that is uh, required and it does not usually involve disclosure of her actual medical records uh, without her consent. Uh, usually the employer is only uh, uh, entitled to know um, that the employee is under continuous medical care, that uh, the employee is not able to be at work for medical reasons, and um, a diagnosis perhaps, a prognosis for sure. When can we expect you back at work is a totally legitimate question. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the comments made, it wasn't clear from the questioner whether she was on a, a leave that had nothing to do with the medical, reason, that's right. um, and, and I agree completely with the mm -hmm. previous comments, mm -hmm. if, if it was a leave mm -hmm. of absence then they have no right to any inquiry about medical information. Does a company have to have reasonable grounds in order to run surveillance on a particular employee, or is it that company's right to do so? The, the company does not have an absolute right to place someone on surveillance. Um, again, it's a context always in employment. There's a balancing of the employee's right to privacy and the employer's right to know that their employees are being honest with them. So it's, it is really a balancing of rights. Um, to, to think of um, uh, a situation where the employee feels that uh, their privacy right has been invaded, it bears looking at why did they feel that? 
Okay. Is there no connection? Is this just harassment? Is there no legitimate reason? Uh, then the employee needs advice. Uh, if the employer has a legitimate concern, security, um, uh, theft, any of those issues, the employer has a right to make sure the employee is being honest with them. And surveillance may be just part of establishing that. But can it not be very, very difficult establishing that balance of if, if there is reasonable grounds? It is. And, and that's where we often need to be advised and we get into situations where surveillance is, is uh, jumped to. Uh, it, it's rarely the first step that needs to be taken. So most of our advice is to, um, first of all, identify is this the least intrusive thing that can be done? And uh, sometimes there, there's no, no other uh, answer but to put someone under surveillance because you can't catch the person. But generally speaking, you can uh, interview the person, you can act, um, you can ask questions, you can investigate, um, and um, you can establish policies where the employee knows uh, that they're going to be uh, under surveillance. Let's suppose a situation exists like this where the employee does not know that they're under any particular surveillance or ever will be because the policy has not been made known by the corporation, let's say, and this person is put under surveillance for whatever reason. Under what conditions can that employee contest that? The employee can contest um, it if the surveillance goes beyond any reasonable connection to the workplace. Um, if the employee is monitored after work hours, um, followed uh, with no reasonable connection, uh, observed um, with no reasonable uh, connection to work, I think they can clearly object at that point that the surveillance is of no use or relevance to the employment agreement in terms and any action taken by the employer based on that surveillance would be, of no, uh, would be void essentially and of no effect. And they, they would essentially be able to sue for damages if they've lost their employment based on that information. Can this whole suing process not be very difficult? Because here you have a corporation that perhaps has really good lawyers representing them. And here you have an employee trying to contest something. And I would imagine in most cases the employer probably has some kind of grounds in order to establish that. Well, um, employees also, though, have rights. And right. um, litigation these days is uh, primarily moving to a mediation model and a conciliation model. Mm -hmm. So that even though uh, there's a d legal dispute, it often uh, ends up in a mediation situation early on. So the concept of a long drawn out, I'm, my employer's got you know, high priced lawyers and they're going, I can't afford it. That isn't really true these days. A lot of uh, legitimate disputes can be resolved uh, amicably at a mm -hmm. fairly early stage. So I encourage uh, both parties to get advice because often uh, it's when either the employer or the employee has acted without any knowledge of their rights that the, uh, you know, the real wrongs are, are done. That's right. Well, Michael, too, will rejoin us later on as will our first guest. You'll meet our third guest after this. Stay tuned. Hello again. In case you're just tuning in, we're talking about privacy in the workplace. Let us know how you feel on the subject. Numbers are up on the screen. Paul McKeever is our third guest joining us now. His practice is in civil litigation, primarily in the area of business. He's also leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario. Thanks for being with us here today. Thank you, Christine. Now, leader of the Freedom Party of Ontario, how do you feel about this whole issue of privacy in the workplace? Well, it's certainly not a simple one. Uh, I disagree with the the current path of the law where we're saying we have to balance a person's rights of privacy which are newly developing mm -hmm. uh, in terms of definition versus business or something along these lines. I think the appropriate way to protect a, an employee in these situations is to say that um, you know an employer owns certain property, phones, computers, etc. They pay an employee wages and uh, there are agreements made for the use of those things during company time. As long as the employee is made aware of what sort of privacy the employer is willing to extend, then there should be no complaint when uh, no more than that amount of privacy is extended. So for example, if, if you own your own bedroom window and you choose to undress in front of it uh, without closing the curtains, that's your choice. And someone outside can't be held liable for taking a picture of you when you didn't choose to close the curtains. 
if your employer owns the window and chooses not to give you curtains to use, then you as an employee are free to choose whether or not to undress in front of the window, knowing that there are no curtains there and that the employer might be the person with the camera outside. So if you just simply look at it as a matter of you're using someone else's stuff or you're being paid by someone else for this time, and uh, you're no as long as you're given adequate notice of what sort of privacy is going to be extended to you by the employer, I think all's fair. But you mentioned this whole issue of knowledge. What about in cases perhaps where it wasn't disclosed to the employee previously and they found that they were spied on or they were watched? Yeah. What do you do in a, what do you believe about a situation like this? Well, we, we're dealing here with presumptions and I think mm -hmm. the natural presumption under most circumstances should be that the person who, for example, lends you the cell phone, uh, if they don't say to you, well, and by the way, I, I promise never to check where you made your calls, mm -hmm. the assumption should be it's their property, they're going to look after their own property, including how it's been used. However, custom tells us there are certain things mm -hmm. where we don't have to make that assumption. For example, if you put a change room in your, pl yes, in your place of work. I was about to ask you that question right. next, that there should you be limits. <laughs> that's right. I mean, you yes. put a, the, the presumption there, the custom tells us that the employer is telling you by putting this closed unit there that you aren't going to be looked at. And if the employer chooses to put a, a, a camera in there, then I think the custom should also say that informed consent requires you to have a sign on that thing saying, if you go and change in here, the employer will be able to see you. And if you choose nonetheless to change in there, again, no problem. Uh, it's just a question of making sure there's informed consent and then understanding between the parties about where the lines of privacy will be drawn. Yes. Well, let's go to John on line six. Hi, John. Yes, hello. Uh, my uh, question uh, is basically related to uh, private or personal information that um, I, uh, I uh, when I was looking for work, I basically uh, uh, knew somebody that uh, had some personal information on me. And uh, when I, I was told uh, that the employer would like me to take a test, and, uh, and I could decide I wanted to take the test or not. And if I didn't take the test, I probably wouldn't get the job. Um, it involved uh, some information related to the work I was doing, but not really. Um, I suppose it was a test to prove whether I was an honest person or not. Now, I had taken this test previously with a company um, that uh, uh, was owned by somebody else before this company, and I had passed this test. And, uh, but what I did find is, is that uh, they never called me back to let me know whether I had gotten this job or was going to be interviewed further. And I called a couple of times, and um, I was uh, somewhat uh, disappointed. The other thing I was told is that the, there was the same person who had worked in the personnel department that was employed at this new company. And I thought, uh, really, there was uh, no way that... Um, I could ever um, protect myself uh, in regards to anything, like in regards to my health situation, um, that these people didn't know about. Okay, thank you for your call, John. Mm -hmm. can, can th thank you for your call. Do you think you could say anything to John? And I'm not sure if there was the a, I didn't hear a question in particular there. Certainly I heard some concerns. Um, I think, speaking as a lawyer now, there would be uh, certain questions that an employer couldn't ask, and I'm not sure what the nature of the test yes, was, but if yes. they related, for example, to a physical disability, uh, that would fall under human, human rights legislation. That's right, that's right. Um, I'm not sure in particular what his concern was, so it's, I'm finding it hard to... Sometimes it's difficult because you don't have the entire, the entire bit of information, but we were speaking previously about uh, an individual's rights, and your point of view, if I gathered it, mm -hmm. was you're on somebody else's property, so if you're on somebody else's property, you should understand that they could basically, if, if they see the need to, to watch what you're doing or to monitor what you're doing, it's their right to do so. Well, certainly we wouldn't get As, to Aside from washrooms. I mean, this is something, oh, sure. change rooms, these types of um, sure. places are, are a privacy violation. Certainly. But do you see any other scenarios in a workplace that perhaps can be construed as being against a person's personal rights or being an infringement upon that, person, that person's right? If we're talking about the use of, for example, computers that are owned yes, by the company. Yes, uh, and phones. And, and phones and, and, the phones and, and that type of a thing. Yes. I think there, again, custom or policy determines whether or not you should be extended the privacy that you'd like. If there is no policy allowing you uh, that privacy, if there is no custom by which the employer has never, you know, 
uh, monitored phone calls, I think the assumption has to be you're using someone else's phone. Uh, and so don't be surprised if they look at what's happening with their phone from time to time. However, if the custom is that uh, Mary and Sue and John and Bill uh, never have their calls monitored and they never get reprimanded for making personal calls, mm -hmm. And, and everyone knows it and the employer has acknowledged it, then I think you have a situation where that uh, degree of privacy should be extended to everyone yes. uh, unless there is a policy to the contrary, an express policy to the contrary. And I think that's just, again, a simple matter, not of any privacy rights, mm -hmm. but of a contractual Courtesy, agreement. perhaps, under a contractual agreement. Correct. There's an understanding yes. and a consent to the use of the property under certain terms. Do you think there's a role of courtesy in all of this? I because think, like, I'm thinking in terms of, well, apparently when a legal right is concerned, there are not a whole lot of legal rights on behalf of the employee because if there's, re if there's some kind of a reasonable grounds to, um, to look at somebody or to establish they may be doing something wrong, the employer can go ahead and do it. But at the same time, suppose you have a company, because it is on the rise, mm -hmm. the, the occurrences of having somebody watched and, and monitored. Right. Can this not break down morale, let's say, in a workplace? Yeah, and that's... If, a, if people constantly feel that they're being watched, because more and more companies are drifting more um, to open relationships, to human resource management, mm -hmm. whereas, where that, there's that bit of a less of a power distance between the employer and the employee. But does that not set up a huge power distance if, if the policy is known in an organization? And can it not destroy the morale in a place. Well, the employer better hope not, uh, because they won't have many because, employees. Yes, and, and that's, a, that's a concern. Sure. I, I think that the, the, the employee and the employer are protected in that situation by the mere fact that nobody has to work for anybody. So if a person's uh, environment, work environment, is made so poor uh, that everybody's turned off by it, clearly the employer's put himself in, in trouble or herself in trouble by not extending for example, the courtesies that uh, uh, most employees are going to expect. So market conditions will determine the, the appropriate terms for the contractual relationship between the employer yes. and the employee. Well, we have not forgotten you on the phone lines. Before we go for this break, we'll go to Stephanie on line seven. Hi, Stephanie. Hello. Go ahead, Stephanie. You're on the air. Hi. Um, I've been off work for, for a while. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Hello? Hello, go ahead, Stephanie. Hi, I'm sorry. I've been off work for a while. I'm, I was on short-term disability, mm -hmm. and then I, I'm now on long-term disability. When I was on short-term disability, I had to call my company every week and report to them. Now I'm on long-term disability, I have to call every two weeks. And when I call my manager, he wants to know like what, I, what my doctor says to me when I go, what does the doctor check for, I'm, on, I'm going for physiotherapy. He also wants to know what I'm doing at physiotherapy. And his comment one day was, um, all this physiotherapy you're taking is going to make you really strong. And, you know, that really upset me because I've really been ill. I've worked with this company for several, several years, and I've never had any time off. And I've just really had a bad year. So I really want to know, like, what are my rights? Like, do I have to say all of this? Stephanie, thank you so much. That's a very valid question. Mm -hmm. Again, it's to establish where that line is and what are Stephanie's rights to disclose that information. Right, and I think that your previous guest went into mm -hmm. this to some extent. Yes, he did. Um, but the, I guess the bottom line is that uh, the employer has a right to know, and, and what is their concern? They're looking to find out how long are you going to be away from work. If, if it turns out that through repeated checks with you, there is no sign of improvement, it may eventually be the case that the contract has fizzled, or as the lawyers say, um, frustrated. No one's to blame, but health or fate or what have you has entered into the situation and made it impossible for you to provide work for the employer, and the employer therefore is not under any obligation to continue to keep that position open. And we're talking maybe a year or two in some cases. Um, so th I wouldn't get too upset about being asked uh, what your general ability to return to work is when it gets too invasive as to you know what was the nature of the test what was the what was the number you know on this on this you know uh, we're getting into a level of detail there where i don't think the employer has any right uh, to know i think the last guest did it very well in, in explaining that the employer has basically a, a right to know what your work status is right right well today we're talking about the very delicate issue of privacy in the workplace what's your take on it we'll be back after this
Welcome back to On the Line. Our first two guests are back. Brian King is president of our country's largest private investigations firm, King Reed and Associates. And Michael Mulroy is a lawyer with Lang Missioner. We're talking today about privacy in the workplace. Brian, let, I, I'd like to ask you more about the legislation, the privacy legislation coming in in the year 2004. How does it differ from the one now? Well, it's, it, it differ, actually it differs in the standpoint we don't have one now. Uh, this is a new bill that's being introduced. Um, one of the things that, that I should point out about this, this bill is that its original intention was not to deal with the situations that we're dealing with today. The original mm -hmm. intention was this, is that, that um, um, primarily dealing with e-commerce and the exchange of information by credit card companies and that type of thing. It started with the European Union um, enacting their privacy bill and saying that in order for countries to trade with us, you have to adopt a, a, a privacy bill that is, that is um, similar to what we have in place. And I know the Americans have, have, um, have worked on adopting their bill and can Canada has said by 2004, because there was time restraints put on it, um, that we would have our bill. The, the difficulty is, is the bill, the way it is written, encompasses a lot of things that I don't think it was, and, and my two other guests here can correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't really intended for all the minute issues that mm -hmm. are now coming out as a result of this. So it, um, it's going to be interesting when it comes into place. I know that, that um, agencies like ourselves have been lobbying for, um, there, is, there, there is certain... Um, um, exemptions from the bill mm -hmm. for the gathering of information for proper legal reasons where you won't need the standard authorizations that um, that um, will be required under the bill to exchange information and and one of them is for law enforcement purposes um, so I know that agencies like ours are looking to the exemption under the law enforcement aspect when you're investigating criminal activity and that type of thing that's right yeah. okay let's go to Margaret on line eight hi Margaret Hi there. Um, I was listening to your guest, I believe he's a lawyer, and he was stating that it was basically dictated by custom in the marketplace and that these situations would vary from place to place, and I think that's absolutely intolerable. We have a society that is greatly under stress. The workers in this province and in this country are constantly inundated by more and more invasions of their privacy, and I believe that the people are going to not tolerate much more of this, whether companies want to have this kind of power or not, it's not going to be their decision only. Because, in fact, you cannot create a good environment for work and a good environment for people to have a sense of trust of the employer, a good employee-employer relationship. And when you only deal with people as a sense, in, a, in a way that you say, I don't trust anything you're going to do, I'm going to monitor you, you are now creating a society that doesn't work anymore. And 10 years ago, this didn't happen to be the practice. It has become more and more the norm, and people are losing their identities by way of information being transferred to illegal activity, but we are not being the ones protected. And in so many areas, this has gone way too far. The pendulum has to swing back some the other way, I believe security is important, so in those areas you'd have to maintain that. But you cannot undermine individual privacy rights to the point that the absolute innocent person who has no criminal intent or criminal activity in mind or ever would have is going to be subjected to this on an ongoing basis. And, in, and now in many institutions you call in, you ask a question of a person about some business-related incident and you're being taped without your consent your phone calls everything this is going way too far and i believe that governments have a role to play we have to then go out and look at these issues and put everything on a standard so that unless there are security issues involved those issues cannot be imposed on people without their consent. Margaret, thank you so much for your call. You bring up some very valid points. Now we're going to get back and talk more about those points, but we first have to take this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back to our discussion about privacy in the workplace. Just before we went for a break, Margaret <coughs> gave us a call and brought up some interesting issues. Any of you care to respond to Margaret's concerns first? 
Well, Christine, um, Margaret brings up some good points. I sense, I sense a little frustration in her, yes, I, I in her call. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to tell her that um, um, the fear of Big Brother is not, it shouldn't be as strong as what it is. First of all, there are certain laws, and obviously some of the things that she said that if they were taking place, I think are a criminal act. First of all, you can't monitor someone's telephone calls. That's good to know. Whether you're an employer or not an employer, whether you own the telephones or not, unless you have the consent of the employee, because you're still um, uh, mm -hmm. breaching, I think it's section 178 of the criminal code called invasion of privacy. So so there is a law that stops you from, from um, listening to other to other people's conversations if you're not a party to the conversation or don't have the consent of one of the parties. So when she calls into some place, if they don't say to you, your calls are being monitored, be aware that you may be taped or overheard, then they are breaking the as law. As a company policy. As a company policy. Yes. What about as a emails? As a, as, a as a law. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about emails and... Um, emails, I think there, there, there has been um, 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 case precedent that would tend to indicate that personal emails are, 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 are private information. But again, we go back to what Paul had mentioned, that if it's done on a company computer, mm -hmm. on company time, I think you're, you're subject to, to having that, those, those emails checked periodically because it, they are owned by the company. This is, it's, it's, I don't think that we have a clear uh, understanding or a clear guideline with the law yet with respect to where the emails become personal and not personal mm -hmm. if they're done on a company piece of equipment. So my recommendation is to mm -hmm. anybody is, is you don't do personal emails while you're at work That's right. unless you're okay right. with them being viewed by your employer. Exactly. Paul? And you, yeah. you have to know that the policy of your employer may prevent that. Yes. Or in Margaret's case, she may be the force that can help human resources develop a policy that puts some flexibility into Very constructive, yes. and allows the privacy to be maintained mm -hmm. and it sets clear limits so that Margaret feels comfortable that she isn't being spied on, but that the limits are there and abuse yes. will, will be dealt with by the employer. Yeah. Paul, you had a response. It, well, it's very difficult, first of all, to establish across the board standards. I, first of all, I don't think mm -hmm. they're a positive thing, but secondly, different workplaces are going to require very different sorts of uh, privacy regimes. So to say there's an across-the-board privacy where every employee gets, you know, never to have their conversations monitored. Well, what if they're operating the atomic bomb or, a, you know, a nuclear station? I want maybe to have a little bit more monitoring going on there. Um, and I think custom is the way, really, that all employment relationships have evolved. That's the way in which we determine default situations about who knows what and who should be expected to know what and who should be expected to have a right. So we shouldn't be faulting custom, the idea of custom. Really, um, if everybody is consenting to the arrangement, there is no wrong. I think that's important, nothing wrongful there. the consenting, because I think if you look at absolutes, this is a, a person's property and I have that right. I think you can run into serious problems in terms of morale for a place, sure. whereas if you have reasonable grounds, perhaps looking after an employee's well-being because they're drinking on the job and they're operating machinery, yeah. I think that's in everybody's best interest well, you to, to remember, monitor. You have to remember, too, that uh, there was sort of a sentiment there of we need an across-the-board employment standard. The employment standards are often misunderstood. They're, they're, often uh, described as, well, this is about protecting the employee against the big bad employer or protecting the employer against the evil employee. No, it's in fact about preventing competition among mm -hmm. employees. So the person who wants to have every Sunday off, for example, wants a, a, a across-the-board prohibition against working on Sundays to prevent other people from working on Sundays. It's actually yes. an anti-competition statute and where the person who you're against is not your employer but the other people who would do the work that you don't want to do. Hopefully, yes. So that's what this, pri by making it an, an employment standard, a privacy right and employment standard, we not only create all kinds of problems where different workplaces require different privacy regimes, but we also inhibit natural market forces, which make sure that people who are willing to work under certain conditions get the jobs they're willing to work for. Well, we have to go for a break now, but we'll continue talking more about privacy in the workplace after this. Welcome back to our talk about privacy in the workplace. Michael, we were talking actually during the break about the whole morale issue, but there are two sides to that coin when you look at balance being achieved in the workplace. Yes, Christine, we see that um, very often. If the employer does not have policies or takes some sort of corrective action, that can be very damaging to the overall morale. 
where you have the majority of workers are working hard, they're loyal, they're doing a very good job. It is very disheartening to see someone down the, the hall who uh, everyone knows is on the internet uh, eight hours of the day, although that's an exaggeration, but that, that's how it seems to grow. And that's is very disheartening for the entire workforce. So often a good balanced policy can be very helpful to help all, uh, both the employer but also fellow workers. I think a good balance policy is necessary and when you look at this whole issue again of balance, I think it's a matter of can you trust your employer that your employer is indeed looking after the well-being of the place? That's right. Trust is really the cornerstone of privacy rights and also employment rights. Brian, in your experience, do you find that there, there is a, an awkward balance being established in terms of employer versus employee? Now, I know that it's on the rise that corporations are looking at what their employees are doing, but would you say it's one legitimate? Of the, one of the things that I'd like to stress is what's, what's more on the rise, I think, is the proactive activity that's taking place relative to you know, screening out problem employees too. That seems to be more stronger on the rise, um, which means that they won't have to, uh, the percentage or the number of employees that they will have to take these other activities with will probably decrease if they're taking a more proactive um, a route at their, at their hiring process. So in one way, one side is increasing, the other side is probably decreasing. And, and back to the previous question about the morale too, I mean, mm -hmm. um, we find that in, in the cases where we get retained to conduct surveillance on, on um, uh, you know, abuse of, of um, short long-term disability, w, WSIB and that type of thing, in a lot of cases, I would say 80 to 90 percent of the cases, that the tips that lead to that investigation are coming from fellow employees who, who are upset because um, this particular fellow seems to take the same week off every year on WSIB and they know darn well that he's that he's um, involved in some other activity that he shouldn't be and is taking advantage of the employer and the rest of the employees who have to struggle to do twice as much work because that person isn't there. So so uh, I think that whole question that uh, that Mary had regarding morale I think has to she has to look at both sides of that. That Margaret had yes. Yeah. Let's go to Mary on line four. Hi Mary. Mary you're on the air. Okay hi. Hi. Um, I, um, I've been in a department um, with my company for almost six years, you know, over five years. And, um, you know, we have pass cards, you know, to get in and so on. And, you know, uh, but in the last um, couple of months, there has been some theft in the office. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people have lost their wallets and, you know, more than one uh, case of this, um, you know, happened. So security has been beefed up. And we know we've heard that there are cameras in different places. And one of the things that we were, you know, trying to figure out is that if there would be cameras in the washroom, like how far would they go? And, you know, do you have to feel that every time you go in the washroom there's a camera there? We don't know if they're where they are. We just know we've heard that there are cameras. So this is just a question. Could the employer do that? It's not a department store. It's an office. Yes. So that's, you know, the question. Thank you, Mary. Well, legally speaking, there are privacy well, laws regarding somebody using the washroom. But can the camera be in the actual washroom or not? Uh, certainly, they've been used, for example, in criminal investigations uh, where people are using stalls for things that they shouldn't be using them for. Um, but I think the fair answer where the, where the workforce is concerned about what, you know, where are these cameras, certainly the cameras aren't going to be very effective if the criminal who is among the innocent people knows exactly where they are. Uh, however, uh, there are certain reassurances that I think an employer can give an employ employment for his, his workforce that, well, no, of course we're not going to take, you know, uh, ca camera shots while you're in certain places because there an expectation of privacy is, is reasonable and also it's unlikely that any criminal conduct will occur in there that involves theft from the company or that kind of thing. I think to answer that question, um, um, Having being uh, the owner of one of the largest investigation firms, I know what goes on out there, and I don't know any employer mm -hmm. that I know of that would even suggest putting a camera in a washroom. Secondly, I don't know any investigation firm that would install one in a washroom and, not, and be prepared to take on that, that type of liability. Um, I, I think that Paul is absolutely right. It's, it's an expectation of privacy is what the Supreme Court of Canada has ruled. And I think the case precedent was a case in British Columbia that happened about two years ago where a fellow was um, 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 basically squealed upon by his fellow employees.
employees because he was um, sleeping during his midnight shift in the lunchroom. And the employer in that particular case put a, uh, a hidden camera in the lunchroom and um, and um, captured this fellow sleeping over a number of nights, terminated him. The person sued, and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, saying that his privacy was invaded because he was in this lunchroom and he felt there was an expectation of privacy. The, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled on that case that, that there was no expectation of privacy when you're in the employer's premises. They did actually comment the fact that if they had been in the, in the washrooms, yes, there's an expectation of privacy. Yes. But when you're in the, your work environment, and the other thing is, is Common sense would probably dictate that those cameras are probably located in a place where the theft is taking place right. and, and, and may take place. So um, I think that uh, the employees going about their regular type of duties have absolutely nothing to, to worry about because um, the employer and the investigative company that's involved will only We're be have zeroing in on to go for a me. break now, Brian, yeah. but we'll okay. continue this talk on privacy in the workplace after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We're down to the final segment of our show, Privacy in the Workplace. Our guests now will give their final statements. Michael? Christine, thank you. I'd just like to say I think um, employees who are frustrated with this entire issue should, um, should address that with their employer. And I think employers should be sensitive to the employee's expectations. And the way to correct the problem is to have clear policies, engage your workforce in that, and set them and make thank them clear. You. Thank you, Michael. I think really uh, the way I see it, the way, uh, the way the law should evolve, is that informed consent should be the cornerstone for privacy rights uh, in a civil society uh, with freedom, responsibility and dignity for all. That's Thank what you, you need. Thank you. And Brian? My final few seconds. Honest employees, you have nothing to worry about. I'm Christine Williams and from all of us, thanks for watching. CTS, family-friendly television.